seven. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only seven Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you will receive 5% off your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off your orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll gain access to our Facebook-only community, You'll gain entrance to our weekly and monthly prize giveaways, specific members only content, and so much more. Again, we are only seven Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. Here we are. We are the halfway point with the old month of June. It's a really weird month. We are not yet in the official summertime, but the fish are kind of thinking that. Though this year has been just wonky as hell. I feel like we never had a pre-spawn. It went from winter to it's time to spawn now, guys, real quick. And I feel like all the fish have been kind of feeling out those kinds of temperature differences. And for it being June, it just feels, and maybe I'm getting older now, so I start talking like this. It feels like it was warmer last year than this year, just generally speaking. Uh, I remember going outside, and there's not a lot of bugs in the evening. It's really crisp, almost like it's still spring. I don't know. It's just really weird out. But, uh, yeah, we're going to get into it here. We had a great event on the Toyota, or a great event on the Potomac. The Toyota Series was in. I had a great conversation with Michael Cat, who won his very first event. Really, really cool event there. And we're going to be going back to some lakes with the man, the myth, the legend, Tyler of High Pole guide fishing services tyler how are you doing hey i'm doing good thanks for having me again thomas love being here and talking fishing you're always welcome sir um so i mean what have you been up to um well you know up to a week ago i was out there a ton uh running a lot of guide trips uh fished a, a lot of tournaments in april a few in may once we get into like the summer when school's out it's really hard for me to jump in derbies i don't have that luxury or the, the free time as much this time of year which is unfortunate because it's my favorite time to fish but basically just running a lot of guide trips and being really busy with that and then getting in the occasional tournament when i can one one thing i really want to talk to you about i had several tournaments at lake anna when everyone does which is early spring and i got there like mid-april and generally speaking and maybe this is old adage but that's a time that you will have some spawning fish ready to go and i talked to a couple people down there i think i talked to you and it was like a lot of the fish were like spawned out by mid-april it felt like and we're already moving to post spawn did, did it feel like the lake was just it was ahead of schedule this year compared to other years or right on schedule yeah I I think in years like this, you do get a big population of fish that are ahead of schedule, but you still do have, you know, the same fish that will be spawning throughout April. I mean, I've seen saw fish on in beds in May, but I do think the start of the spawn or the first big wave this year to me was a lot earlier than normal. Um, but yeah, it, it was weird because you, you could catch them in all three stages. You could, and then you could see a fish on a bed and then you could move out to some post spawn, you know, deeper point or deeper structure or something and catch a fish that obviously had spawned you know a while ago and there was fry garters this year very early um i mean like very very early like early april it might be yeah it must have been like the first week of april or so um there was already fry garters why do you think that was um i mean the, the winter was definitely mild um i know i definitely i spent a lot of time out there this winter and 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 suffered and it was cold but like overall it wasn't that cold uh and we did have a lot of warm fronts you know in february and you also have to remember that since anna's a power plant lake and it's getting that constant water like pushed in um by the dam at the dike uh you know that's always going to speed up things as well um just having that water be more stable um always constantly pumping in warm water and then again i think we just had a warm winter and a quick transition to spring I really think so too. I mean, this same thing is happening at Mountain Lake, the Potomac River here. Going from winter to 
almost like again i say like just spawning conditions and you didn't have that cold water and that gradual warm-up to really prime them i think really screwed up a lot of anglers when it came to pattering fish this year yeah yeah i think it it did so i, I had a lot of fun with it this year just the junk fishing aspect of it because you could you could go do multiple things you know um there was a week in early march where i could go skip docks and catch like two and a half three pounders and then i could go third and fish 30 foot down and catch suspended fish on a demiki rig or close to the bottom so it was like fish all over the place doing all different things all throughout the year and that transition to the post spawn too um i i got on like well, before they really got offshore and got out there that's what i was waiting for that's what i love and i got on that this year very early i mean really early than what i'm used to and it was like it's so fun because it's it's like that first wave that pulls up the spawn or that first like shallow push for pre-spawn fish when they do that thing in the post spawn it's the same thing those fish just eat i love that you mentioned junk fishing because i've had a couple of people say it seems like this year more than other years at lake anna it was you could do a little bit of this a little bit of that would you say like this year is definitely junk fish heavy compared to other years yeah i, I think it felt that way and then also I try to just incorporate a few more things and into like my game this year. Uh, and that just led to me junk fishing a lot more. And then I do just think because there was so many scattered waves or an early push, um, it, you know, you could, you could do anything. You, you could go catch them in a foot or less, two foot, three foot. And then you could, you could go out to 15, 20 foot the same day and catch quality fish. Um, you know, there was, there definitely were a lot more patterns this year in my eyes. I don't know if that's just me, you know, opening up a little bit more on the water and just running new things or it, it was kind of a combination of just this, the fish doing everything and so many patterns that you could run. When with a Lake Anna, a high rock, a Lake Norman places that are, that are a little bit smaller, that are heavy touristy areas. Uh, there's another factor that you really have to deal with, which is pleasure boaters and just the insanity. And so I feel like you can have your summer patterns as in, okay, the summer patterns start when temperatures and all this crap. But I personally think summertime patterns start also as like when the tourism hits and it changes kind of the dynamic of the lake when it gets crowded. Um, w when does summer patterns for you really kick in? Is it after like Memorial Day when like it's just an ungodly amount of people on the water or is it just purely regular pattern kind of shtick? Yeah, I mean, I've gotten so I mean, most people that know me and where I fish on on Anna is out in the middle. I mean, I got I'm so used to just being rocked around by Boak Wake and to me, it just doesn't phase me and I don't even run like the best boat for that kind of stuff. But so I'm so used to it. Um, so I'm out there regardless. And for, for me, like, you know, if they're, I'm just going to look for them out there all the time. Like there's not like a set date. Like I'm just always checking that because I know how fun it is once they get off on that summertime, that first summertime pattern thing. Um, it did start early this year, but like when you talk like late summer and, and, and some real deep, deep stuff that I, that I do on the midsection and dam section, that really doesn't start till July. There's still a lot of fish throughout June that are relatively shallow, but it is more of a summertime pattern, schools chasing bait, big groups sitting up on isolated offshore structure near channels and stuff like that. Um, it, so, so yeah, I mean, I think it just varies, but this year, I mean, it was like middle of May that they were kind of doing that, um, doing that first big offshore summer move. So it, it was earlier this year. Last year, it really didn't, seemed to come into fruition until about June until after after Memorial Day. Yeah, I've always been interested with lakes like that because I was uh, read I think it was like Wired to Fish an article about like how pleasure boaters can create patterns, of course, mud lines and things like that. But then you also think about how that affects the shallow bite. And does it get so bad out there that it does affect a shallow water bite and you have to go offshore? Or is that more of like it's just inconvenient for the angler? um yeah so i mean you said something interesting there and like i'm really a, a firm believer in this now because i've watched it very closely and with live scope on the past two years is there are certain offshore spots um that the fish sit on 
And when there is more boat wake, they specifically position with that boat wake, almost like you would think how they would with the wind. Um, there's a few spots on the lake that they do this this time of year and in the summer because of the boat wake and the way that it's constantly, you know, pushing and rolling. And those those fish are typically a little bit easier to catch, actually, because of that disturbance, that, that mm -hmm. surface disturbance. Um, so I, I do find that that to be super helpful actually in some situations as annoying as it is i know there's spots this time of year that that pressure or boat traffic actually can you know fire things up or make it easier to fire things up with different baits how much does it affect your ability to use forward-facing sonar because i i know when i've gotten out on lakes and it's rough as hell it's like oh my god it's hard on my little 10-inch screen to see, see stuff when you're smacking yeah no it, that can make it difficult especially i mean if you see like a big wake boat go by i just kind of yeah. i'm like do i kind of preemptively pan before it gets to me and know that i'm gonna have you know like this six five second span where it's basically useless just because the tr i'm getting rocked and you know you can't even use a trolling motor so yeah it definitely does get annoying um but yeah i think there's just ways to to kind of get around get around that uh and, and use it to your advantage let's see we got a really good question here by, by or question statement by michael here uh talking about the temperatures and oh, wrong question there we go this one here uh close observation station for lake anna is charlottesville january february 2024 was much colder than 2023 march 2024 was way warmer than than last year and i think that was the big kicker to me because i i heard guys at smith mountain lake talking about that too where march was super warm i remember the first bfl i was down there for it and it was like 75 80 degrees like the first week of march and it really messed the fish up and so i i I really think it's that March, April time frame that if you have weird weather, then it does affect them. So Mike, thanks so much for that. Uh, uh, reach out to me on, yeah, reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook messenger, or email me fishing the DMV at gmail.com. You just want a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. Yeah, that, that is interesting. So when does the night fishing bite get good on Lake Anna or is there a night fishing bite on Lake Anna? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's good night fishing. I mean, I think, most i think most lakes um are are good night fishing in the summer and it usually starts around may june um and even probably gets better all the way through july um but yeah no there, it, there is a great night fishing bite and it is a lot of fun out there and you can fish more like relatively you know shallow and stuff like you like you would think you could you don't have to be in some crazy you know offshore random honey hole or anything Right now, there was something that we probably have to talk about because it was all over God's Earth news-wise. Is I guess it was E. coli that broke out on the lake or anything. Mm -hmm. Since you, you've been down there a bunch, what's the situation on that? Are are you aware of it or? Yeah, no, I'm aware of it. Um, I, I believe, to my knowledge, that took place um, up the splits a little bit, and it's actually, you know, I don't want to say anything wrong or get it wrong. Um, but I know it happened in a congested, crowded area. I mean, it's very unfortunate. Um, you know, I, I hope they investigate it and figure out, mm. you know, what caused that. And, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly what it was. And, you know, if, you know, don't, don't drink lake water. I know no one meant to on purpose, <laughs> but just don't do it. Yeah. Doesn't, good things don't happen when you do that. And yeah, hopefully they figure it out. Um, but I believe that, usually somewhere up the splits you should see things like that with the water and now it blooms happens up that way yeah that, that's never a good deal has it affected the fishing at all i haven't noticed it no uh this time of year too i'm rarely up that far where i think it happened i am that you know occasionally for certain things but i haven't noticed it affect fishing at all why why well, I mean, why don't you fish above the splits like that generally speaking um it, it's not that i don't because i do people i mean you definitely will see me up there but i definitely focus on the midsection um and i wouldn't say went very close to the dam but really a, the midsection and you know relatively close within a half mile of the dam this time of year uh it's just the type of fishing i like to do i just i know that area of the lake very very well um things piece together for me very quickly there um I know enough things where if this isn't working, then I can quickly cross that off and, you know, go to something that is going to be working. 
Um, I've almost got that. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm the greatest fisherman in that section or anything like that, but I've got that section down to a science where it just takes, you know, boom, boom, boom. And then, you know, on them for the rest of the day. But that's just from being out there so much. What is the water willow like right now? Has it come up pretty good this year? Yeah, yeah, it has come up pretty good this year. I actually caught a lot more fish this year out of water willow than I did last year. I did fish it a little bit more, and I got on this really cool spot that kind of kept on refilling. Uh, you know, it's like more and more fish seemed to come through it throughout the month of May. It was a really cool just main main lake area, and there was water willow there and caught quite a few nice ones, you know, out of it. Even decent one on a frog, a um, few on the G-crack bellows gill that I like to use. Caught a few even on beds and willow grass, which, you know, they're, wow. they always they always are on beds and willow grass. But I I've not seen that on Anna as much as I had this year. Again, I could have just ran into more, just been looking in those areas more. Yeah, that that is interesting. I'm just glad that we're seeing that that willow grass really take to Lake Anna because it does create and establish a consistent shallow water bite that really wasn't there. I think before the willow got in. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's and there was a really good like dock bite this year too. Like there, like it, it was it, it for a bit. It was really wide open, and the shallow stuff actually was what I went and did really all April and most of May until they got out there, and I couldn't help myself. But definitely was a good shallow bite. You haven't just been on Lake Anna though. And then guys, again, if you have Lake Anna questions for, for Tyler, please drop them in the comment section. I'll make sure I get them answered. But uh, following you on the old social medias, you have been all over God's earth fishing. What what, what prompted that? Um, You know, I just, I, I like to fish different bodies of water. It keeps me fresh too. Um, yeah, I fish Anna so much that it's nice to do that. I fish tournaments on you know the aquan reservoir you know i fished some derbies with mccluskey on the potomac um i've been to gaston this year um where i'm missing so many places but yeah i have i've, I've gone around a lot more jumped into more derbies kind of just trying to get better at everything a little bit more well-rounded the the clear water offshore thing i'm i don't i feel like i you know almost got to a point where I can 100% get better. But if I want to be more well-rounded, I need to go, you know, do some more things more often. Yeah. Cause I think this year you hooked up with Mr. McCluskey and then Mr. Streichel of SB fishing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I fished with, uh, I fished with, uh, Matt Streichel on Anna. He came out, we had, we had some fun out there. It was a really cool day. We caught him on one of the most fun techniques to, to catch, uh, you know, fish this time of year. It was fun. Uh, and then me and McCluskey fished a res tournament, um, and we fished a, a couple or uh, Wednesday night out of the Potomac. And we've also, and then he came out with me on Anna, you know, last week. And, you know, I just basically would like, it was so nice with him. I'd just be like, take him to a general spot and be like, here you go. Like, just do whatever. <laughs> and I could just like sit down and I would just let him do his thing. And we, um, we got on him pretty good on, on the big top water bait. I think he, he had fun with that thing. So that got, got to see the power of that giant top water I threw out there. That's catching on. And I've been telling people about it cause I have a big tuna popper that I, that I throw, um, that I got, I think it's bass pro shop. I'll, I'll let you guys know the model of it, my next stream. But the fact is like it, the size of it is so weird where you would think that would limit the size of the fish, but you'll still get two pounders that'll come up and smoke those big things, which is, Oh, crazy yeah. yeah we've already had it so one we we lost in a tournament actually we had and this was early may that's why i got on this or like the beginning of may this year but i was showing the mega dog um it's that big like two ounce top water uh had one fish front hook one fish back hook when we went to net one pulled they both came off and then just a few days ago uh before my accident i had the same thing i you know flipped in a three and a two back hook front hook so they'll actually because it's so big like they will eat it out of the other's mouth they will chase that fish down um it's a really i mean just the draw power i think that's a huge thing too like uh, clear water people like you know you always want to downsize downsize but upsizing can has sometimes that same exact power as downsizing especially in clear water uh and especially fasting fast retrieve baits and you know, I think people have like this common misconception of sometimes clear water, like very Vanessi, slow moving and like that. But 
you know, really to, to get fish fired up and active in that clear water, you have to really burn something. I mean, really burn it. It's if you guys have watched any blueback tournaments before, you can see that where sometimes they don't even work the walking bait. They just reel it in. Yeah. Um, there was a couple of great images of that. I think it was this past, this past tournament on Murray where it was, they just cast it out. They saw an explosion and you were just burning that thing as hard as possible. And you're getting bites. It, it, it is the action, the movement of it fleeing. And it has to be a blueback thing is, is why it trains those fish to do that. In my opinion. Yeah. When you, um, so I, I've been lucky enough now a couple of times, and this is what actually made me almost completely change some of the baits I throw the way I retrieve them and everything was I've been lucky enough in clear water and Anna to see exactly what it looks like when a fish is chasing a blueback herring and how they gang up on it, how quick it is, how just it's insanely fast. Uh, when you see that you realize that you cannot reel a bait faster than how what these fish want it at all. And they want it fast. The second that you kill something or stop it or let it drop below them and certain times of the year when they're chasing those like fast baits like a herring um you know it's over you have to burn i mean burn it i agree with that 100 percent. we got some great questions here we'll kind of get to these now uh see john says moved from lake anna to smith mountain lake in october boy do i miss that willow grass frog bite smith mountain lake that would be bitching if if they had willow grass and lily pads too that'd be awesome and john that's a hell of a power move to say like i'm just gonna switch from like <laughs> to smith that's pretty cool uh salt box hey tyler uh have you caught any snakehead on anna this year i'm fishing there in july and hoping i will have a chance at catching one in the lower part of the lake if possible yeah i've got a funny story of that with uh with uh, mccluskey so <laughs> when we were out there uh i have this bait that i not one I, I tell too many like people, but it's not like a super secret, but I give them one. It's this big bait. And I'm like, you burn that thing. Like you just like burn it as fast as you can. We were, we were sitting under a dock because a thunderstorm had ran through. And so we're under a dock and like he ties it on and he's casting out the back of the boat onto an island and burning it. And the next thing you know, you see wake behind it and just, and then like, a big snake head jumped like four foot in the air. And so we're hiding from a thunderstorm and McCluskey's fighting a snake head, burning this bait. I mean, as fast as he could. And you know, it was the whole thing. So yeah, I have caught snake head and I've, I've seen them been caught very recently. Uh, you, you definitely have a chance to catch them on. You can fish pretty shallow and stay relatively shallow in the summer and catch them. Yeah. And, and then salt box, if I, if I was going to add, it's just super shallow around anything, whether it's a tree, water willow, water willow is probably the best thing, generally speaking, to catch them around. At least that's what it is like on the resin places like that. Uh, let's see. We got Mark here. Mark Burke. What is the best day of the week to fish Anna? The worst day of the week, all factors included. Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, as far as just not dealing with boat pressure and, and traffic, you know, the middle of the week, the fish aren't going to be as pressured in the middle of the week. Um, the worst days, again, by boat traffic, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But to an extent, I will say, like, and I've learned this very heavy over the past year, is it, it doesn't matter. what The conditions that are going to happen for that day are more important than the best day. And I don't, you never know if that's a, a Monday through Sunday. It could be any day of the week. On the conditions it could be the busiest day out there of the year and those fish could be fired up because just the conditions are right and the way the bait is acting um like last fourth of july caught a lot of good ones and it was insanely busy but it was just one of those days it was you know it, it's weird it's so hard to put into words i'm out there so much but there are just days where it is just so much better than others and it all is you know condition based um and you know there's there's going to be days where it's going to suck but just to have the most things to yourself i would go on a wednesday you know tuesday wednesday thursday i 100 percent agree with that it you're going to have the least amount of pressure if you can go during the week versus the weekend and you're just also not going to run into some safety issues with jet skiers and things like that yeah. do you think do you think fireworks and boat traffic scare the fish at all or, or is it something that no matter what, it never, it never bothers them. Uh, I could see like fire, maybe like fireworks, loud noises. If there was, you know, fish like shallow, cause you know, the noise has to, I don't know. The noise has to travel through the water. I think it travels through 
water quicker than it does air. So there has to be some sort of thing that can mess that up. Uh, but boat wake, I, fish on Anna are so conditioned to boat wake, it doesn't. It that's all mental. It's if you can deal with it. The fish don't don't care. They're so used to it. We got Timmy. Timmy says, uh, "Them Anna fish like NASCAR, hundred <laughs> percent." And and then we got Austin here, Baker. Do the blueback roam into open water like shad, or do they mainly stay near clay banks? So clay banks, in my opinion, that's where they spawn. That doesn't mean that's where they stay twenty four seven. That's just their spawning, perfect spawning habitat. Yeah, they they roam in open water um, this time of year and a lot in that traditional post spawn June. What you get usually is you know groups and schools of fish that are trying to break apart herring and, and single out a solo one. They're they're very rarely, especially on the flats this time of year, feeding on a school of herring unless they're spawning. Then it will it'll sound like cannonballs going off and striper and bass will be going at them at the same time. That is an incredible fun main lake to dam bite that when you get on, it is so much fun and you're like, I want to do that again. Like that is fun. But this time of year and earlier from now, usually they're chasing a solo heron that they broke apart from the school. And that well, that fight will go out into open water off on big flats and and different things like that. But like Thomas said, clay is mainly their they're spawning, which they'll still be spawning. Um, there, there's random herring spawns actually that can happen throughout the summer. Yeah, and, and and what I've learned from fishing Carolina lakes is they will spawn in an inch and a half of water. So it's not necessarily that you're casting to the point, but it, when they're chewing on them, it is you got to throw that bait as shallow as humanly possible to get them to react, since they're corralling them against the bank. Um, yeah, but yeah, fun fast bait. too. Usually in that situation, that's another where you, you want to go fast if you fish slow during that where they're actively feeding they won't yeah. they won't eat it well, yeah and that that's really gets back to the original point where speed is a factor to get them to react they literally do not think it's a blue back unless you are burning that thing as hard as humanly possible when they're dialed into that yeah when you're not doing the top water and the blue back bite is it really just a finesse kind of just scope them out on brush kind of deal yeah yeah um you know there's a lot that goes into a base on if i'm gonna go vanessa or if i'm this time of year you can you can find a lot of bigger fish that are solo or you can find the big group of fish and then you can find you know a few bigger ones that are hanging out by themselves closer to the bottom this time of year and that is usually in that situation where i can fire up that school that they're kind of a part of but not really a part of you can fire them up with a fast bait and you can switch over that finesse thing, you know, on scope and using scope to really single out that one fish. Um, so that's kind of what I what I do. And yeah, definitely a lot of finesse fishing. Uh, you know, if the school if you if it's a day, you, you'll know if it's a day that you just can't really get the schools fired up and, and that sort of thing. And those are the days where I do, you know, pull out the littler baits or even sometimes on those dates, you know, upsizing. That's been a bit big for me just as much as downsizing on, on the lake this year is just throwing bigger bigger baits and on a tough day you can get a school fired up like that that is interesting stuff interesting stuff and then guys just try to try to get your questions answered just uh put them in chat and i'll try to get them answered for you from tyler gaston the potomac why gaston uh so actually gaston's probably the lake that i caught my first bass on i want to say when i was like in fifth grade or so um i was pretty young uh, first bass i caught so we i had vacation there with my family for like a really long time and my brother actually lived there um worked you know at the lake uh for a company there after he graduated um so I, i've been to gaston i'm actually really familiar with gaston and um, that's one of my favorite places to fish it kind of sets up like anna it, it's it doesn't and it does. There's some similarities, especially when you get to the dam side, but there is like a fun, shallow, you know, power fishing bite on Gaston. And this year it was a lot of fun. It was high, muddy water. Um, I went there and I want to say it was March or early April and just slung a chatterbait around like just shallow, shallow grass, muddy water and caught them really good and then used scope to go catch spots. So I just think it's a fun fishery. What is the 
the split between the spots and the larges because it seems like when I've had people on before, it feels like it's predominantly spots and you have to hunt that large mouth bite. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's exactly what we had. Like I could go and catch 50 spots a day, like easy, <sighs> like not, Damn. they weren't all be big or anything that yeah. it honestly was annoying. But yeah, I did. One day I spent a lot of time figuring out just specifically how to catch the larges. And it was just a shallow, muddy water stump deal. Uh, so yeah, I did like, because I was like, man, I want to catch big larges. I know they're going to be up shallow and I really don't want to catch like 300 of these small spots. When you get in tournament situations like that, do you prefer to hunt the largemouth first and then later in the day fill out your spots? Or do you fill out the limit first, then hunt largemouth? I think that would depend on the time of year and what kind of bites are going on. So, like, say if it was, like, primarily a spawning deal, like a largemouth spawning deal, then you know you're not really going to get on that good, you know, sight fishing bite until the sun came up. So I would probably just go get my, you know, my 10 pounds of spots or whatever um, and do that and then transition. But I think different times of the year, maybe if it was summer, I'd be like, I'm going to go try to do the early morning largemouth deal on, like, top water up shallow or, or hit – a certain spot and then i would go so i think that would just depend kind of on the time of year if that makes sense that makes sense that really does it's just interesting like listening to so many pros now about whether you you go for and i'm gonna say it's just like it's a jackpot term you're jackpotting it no points i would feel like you would want to try to get your biggest fish first to fill out the limit because the thought process there is if you don't get that big one it doesn't matter it's a mute point but i could see on the other hand where it's like well you gotta at least have your limit first before you go hunting. And I don't know, it just, to me, the issue I've had with the old school mindset of get a limit, then go hunting, is you're not necessarily gonna be hunting in the best time of the day, because that would usually be probably from 11, let's say perfect world, 11, 10 a.m. onward, which is not necessarily the best time. I don't, I don't know, it, it's, I've always yeah. bounced back and forth between those thoughts. Yeah, I would think about that. Like on Anna for now, like the thing that I had to get out of is like, I'm consistent out there as far as catching a limit and so i know that so now i'm like all right dummy like you know how to do that go do what's harder first and i pretty much do that every single time now on anna that's my mindset because you know if i'm comfortable with the lake and i know i can just go get a limit real quick then like if i know that i should probably start with the harder thing first well what is the hardest thing for you to do in general um well, that a lot, <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't know. I think for me, like I'm, I'm so comfortable in my mindset on that body of water that it cannot be against me, uh, a little bit. Like I said, I know I can go catch five. That's whatever. But what I need to do is be able to just put my head down and like be comfortable with doing the thing that can get me the five big bites instead of getting the. 15 to 30 bites a day this time of year i know i can get but i need to you know just actually get honed in because sometimes what i'll do is i'll get two big bites and then i'm like all right now like i you know i could really be not playing it safe here now i'm just gonna go get my other three and then i spend an hour getting my other three and then i'm like well now i need to go get big one and so sometimes i can buy myself get caught in that like just having that mentality of like it's only five bites you need five bites only care about five bites that are big uh, so I think that's something I'm working on. Yeah, I, I need to improve on some of those aspects too. I, I've I had a new philosophy this year for the tournaments I'm fishing, where it's it's not necessarily about the baits or anything; it's just about the area you start in. It's so important to like if you're not on them, the right school it doesn't matter. Like it, it yeah. just it's so much harder to overcome if you start on the shitty part of the river or the lake, even if you're yeah. a great fisherman. It's and that was a hard mindset change believe it or not for me to just think don't worry about dialing the baits but try to figure out where is the best area to start and i, I don't know like that's where i think you have like okay well um you know these certain piscataway or matter woman is a great example like all right yeah it gets a lot of boat pressure but if there's five thousand pounds worth of largemouth it doesn't matter you know if sturgeon creek gets pressure but it always dumps fish the probability is places like that, there will be tournament sized fish, but you have to deal with pressure. And that feels like it's such a, that's the balancing act, I think, versus YOLO, let's run 200 miles and hope for the best. Yeah. And there's absolutely. And again, I can't speak for 
all the way, you know, up the splits past the bridges, <clears throat> but there's 100%. And this is what kills me so much for being out there so much that it can get in my head. Mm. There are certain creeks and certain areas in there where if you just get D5 right bites in specific creeks right there, you will win the tournament. But it's dang hard to sit there and grind that out without freaking out and, and all that. And you might you might screw up. Like it, it is a gamble, but there is small areas like Sturgeons for one. I think any turn on that lake could be one out of Sturgeon if you got the five bites. Um yeah. But you could say that almost about any creek, really. Um, now, a few you you can't this time of year, but like you could say that, you know, about Dukes. You could say that around Tara, you know, Tar Shore, that area. Um, so yeah, that's that can that can also play into the mental aspect too, especially if you're out on a certain body of water that often. Well, I mean, you just you kind of passed over that earlier. I want I want to talk about like you sitting in a spot, and you start freaking out when you're not getting bit, like. How long, and if you're in a tournament, you're like, oh shit, I need to make a move. Is that five casts? Like, is that depending on the day where you start getting that that anxiety? Um, yeah, so for me, again, it's just a luxury of being. If I go to a spot, I make, in a tournament, I can make, this time of year, I can make two or three casts and know if I need to move. Um, and then I just need to basically get my rotation right. Because that spot might not be firing at that moment, but it is going to at some point in the day. So, you know, I can kind of work on that and add that back to the rotation. But that just meant I got this spot the wrong time, go back to the drawing board. You know, what fish could could more, most likely be active now. If you get on the right rotation on these offshore fish, man, it is like you feel like you're the smartest person in the world. But really, you just got a little lucky and hit the rotation and every it's if you do that on Anna this time of year and and May and through June um you know it is it's silly it, I mean, it's so fun how much of that is luck versus a science when it comes to rotating offshore spots to know you started on the right to, to, to hedge your bet that you're starting on the right one yeah i think a lot of I, there can be luck that applies to it. There's a little bit of it, but when you spend a lot of time out there, like I said, like I can go to a few offshore spots and between those three, which one they were biting or how they're behaving, I can just start mentally going that spot. No, this spot, no, this spot. Yes. And then kind of go like that. And that is again, just from being out there so much and watching how they're behaving on the first three casts I make, you need three casts. Sometimes it can all be with the same bait. Usually I want to do two with, one and then switch up with one, see if they're willing to go down. Um, if they're mm. gonna, if they're, if they're gonna feed up, um, this time of year, you'll get both. Um, but they do especially want to feed up when they're chasing baits and that bites on, they want to feed up, they want it quick. Um, you know, they don't, they'll hit it slow, Ron, don't get me wrong, but they want it fast. You, you want those fish to start fighting over that thing. So your first three spots, I'm assuming you're not going to be saying they're the same three, same water, same everything. You're going to have three varied spots, so it can go into your calculation of, okay, so they hit A, and I have a bunch of spots like A versus B, C that, that are different. Is that is that kind of the vibe? Yeah, so I could say, like, if I want to go, if I haven't been there in a while, so, like, when I go back out, when I get out there for the first time again, because I've been, this is the longest I've been off the water since, like, New Year's Eve, and I, I feel, I feel mm. sick. So I, uh, so when I go back out there for the first time, like this is just an example, I'm going to say, I'm going to hit a deep clay point near channel bend. I'm going to hit an offshore hump and then I'm going to hit an offshore flat. So kind of some variation right there. I know there's fish on all three of them, but what fish that day are going to be more active? How are they positioned? Is there a different structure on the spot that they're more relating to? Or do they want to feed up? Do they want to feed down? Are they schooled? And if I can, you know, go to those three spots, and do that or maybe i just go to the first one and it's so good like that clay point with brush near the channel bend is often i know all right, i'm gonna go find brush or, or clay points that are right near channel bend and just kind of hit it like that and then if that dies and go back to the offshore flat thing that doesn't work then you know go to the offshore the hump or something or the isolated high spot um and just kind of doing that and it just becomes a process and it um your decision making just becomes so much, so much quicker with offshore stuff when you when you spend a lot of time doing it and just seeing the, the, how those fish are behaving pretty quickly. Do you label things in your GPS 
if they're all the same thing, is it a, a numbering system, a color code system? If they're all kind of like the same spots just to keep them clean? Yeah, I, I go through a lot, actually. And that's one thing I've gotten better at this year. It's cleaning up the things and marking them so I know what they are. I think yeah. if someone looked at mine, they'd be like, what the hell? Because I have like different <laughs> I have different points of where I know to stop the boat. So when I put live scope down, it'll be at 100 foot. And then I have a point where exactly where the structure is that I want to fish. So like I, I try to have a system like that um, just so I can make sure I'm not getting too close Again, the fish on Anna, and I've noticed it more this year. They are definitely more boat shy now than they have than they were last year, and they definitely more boat shy than they were the year before. With the and cancer they, beam, and they're definitely mm. picking up on the thing. Sometimes you can get on an active group, and you have three, four casts, and you you might as well move. Unless it's one of those crazy feeding windows, crazy feeding times where they're just really fired up and they're going to eat. Um, you've got like three four maybe even five casts at most before those fish just know and you you might as well just get out of there hmm and do you think that's because of the scope or just just you you the pressure of the boat and the fishing line and all that crap some of them i'm pretty sure it's because i pressure the shit on them too much and <laughs> bring a lot of and ha and bring clients there and stuff so like I, I know that i have to run different rotations for different days of the week um I think some of it's me. I think some of it's fishing pressure. I think some of it is live scope. I think these fish are seeing baits in places a lot more now that they're not used to. Um, they're still very catchable. Uh, I don't think it's like hurting them or like killing them or anything, but I do see that like last year, last year, I think last year really was when like everyone had live scope on their boat. Like mm -hmm. that was like a big thing. And now, you know, more people do, but last year it still wasn't that utilized or people had it and seemed like they didn't really know what to do and a lot of people are getting better with it and some of that is me i mean i do that that's part of what we do but i'm just seeing that these fish are you know they're catching on a lot quicker and getting a lot more smarter on some of these spots that are pretty you know out there and you have to spend a lot of time to find do you think fish offshore reset faster or fish that are holding to water willow or a dock reset faster hmm Good generically question. speaking i'd probably say offshore that's i i would think offshore they reset quicker um yeah i would say that because see typically when they're offshore this time of year there's a larger population um okay. so i'd say you just with the odds and that sense that you know you have a larger population they're typically grouped up or just around each other in the same general area maybe and there might be multiple schools and multiple groups in this area um and they're constant especially this time of year they're always moving around for bait and sometimes so then they'll sit on structure and kind of sit there and those are the ones you got to fire up and then there'll be groups of three to seven that are constantly running around looking for bait so they almost kind of recirculate and cycle around themselves this time of year in a lot of offshore spots hmm Interesting stuff. We do have a couple of questions here, guys. I'll make sure I get to them. Let's go. With Big Mike's Fishing Chronicles. How did you start fishing big topwater baits? And what did you start with? Um, I'll be honest. The big topwater thing, I was ha I do this a lot, actually. I still do this to this day. Is I'll get, I won't catch them doing anything, and I'll start being like, you don't know what you're doing. You suck at fishing. Like, talking to myself. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try this one thing. And I, I did this, I can't, I think it was two years ago. Um, I had saw two bass, two really big five, six pounders soloed out a solo herring and chasing it really fast. And it was a big herring. And after I saw that on this day that I was bummed out, I was having a tough day. I wasn't getting the bites I thought I should. I tied on a giant, the biggest top water I had after what I had just seen those fish do that herring and threw it on a shallow point and, Cut a four and a half, next cast cut a five and a half, next cast cut a three. And then I was like, boom, like it clicked. And then when I got live scope, I learned how to pair that big bait pretty well with live scope and how to get it to work on those fish. And, um, but yeah, I started with a KVD mega dog, sexy mega dog, I think is what they call it. It's a uh, big, big top water, two ounce bait. You got to throw it with a little bit heavier rod than a traditional top water bait. And I'd tie it to 30 pound or 40 pound straight braid. Mm, that's freaking awesome. 
Uh, let's see. Next one here is I love your name here. TRD Pro. Love the name. What part of the lake are largemouth bass in this time of year? Mid lake was 81 to 82 degrees on Sunday. Oh, I mean, this time of year, they're everywhere. I mean, you can run all the way up to the river and catch fish. You could run all the way to the dam and catch a bass. Um, I like... Uh, I like the middle section of the lake this time of year. I mean, I know that's not really a secret to anyone. That's usually where I'm, I'm fishing the middle of the lake or closer to the dam, but you can run up the splits, either direction up the, you know, e either one, you're, there's always going to be a population of fish and just maybe doing different things, uh, than they are in different parts of the lake, but they're everywhere. anna has got, and it's definitely got a lot of fish. It it really does. And it really, I think, depends. I could be wrong here. What is your setup? It, I had somebody ask me the other day, their dad and then we're going to the lake for the first time. And I was asked, like, what do you have? And it's like they had like a little tracker and electronics is like go up past the splits, get near the water willow. You're going to have more success. If you have forward facing sonar, I think that does open up where you can try to go have fun. So really just know the equipment you have and what you're comfortable with when you go to the lake. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. We got another one here. Uh, we got Michael again. Uh, with hotter weather a bit earlier, would you expect fishing deeper humps? Deeper humps would be the main object after the early morning topwater bite. Um, yeah. So that all depends on on what you do. So there's always a population of fish on Anna, 365 days a year that are between that. Um, I would say. 10 8 to 8 to 15 foot range uh in the hottest days of the summer um but yeah i definitely you know offshore humps um close to channel bends and isolated stuff like that near flats um yeah, fish definitely get on that and they get grouped up this time of year too so usually when you catch one offshore this time of year it wasn't just a random solo fish he probably had a few buddies nearby um but yeah, uh, you know, you can stay, you can stay shallow though throughout the day. There's, you know, dock bite, or if you go up to splits or you can grass fish, like Thomas said, and, and still catch fish. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, I like the offshore stuff this time of year and finding those little spots where they sit and, you know, you, you definitely will catch fish and be around more than, you know, just a few. 100% there, 100% there. Uh, let's see, how big are you talking? Uh, I'm throwing a five inch Zara spook. That's baby size yeah so the they yeah i mean they all work in different sizes they all work but i i like to throw the kvd mega dog and it's a two ounce i think it's six and a half inches or so um it, it's a big bait it's a big bait it, uh, if you're not used to throwing big topwaters on herring lakes you you might think it's a saltwater bait but it's just a, a very big topwater i mean you could throw some very big topwaters out there and you're not going to scare those fish yeah and then you know i you can also find if you really want to get gnarly i have nines and tens um that but you have to go like looking for musky or saltwater stuff too but again it's just it i really think it's because it's the profile the noise to get them to come up i've seen it not just on lake anna but lake murray where you will cast that bigger one out there over 30 feet of water and it's the splash and the movement that'll get them to pull up off the bottom or over whatever structure to get them to come look at it because generally speaking in these waters where it works it's gin clear they can see very fine and i think 20 to 30 feet of water no problem yeah uh, so. yeah i agree and uh one one side note with that i have to tell the story you got to be careful with that thing when you're throwing it with braid so oh, i was with i was with mccluskey on the res and i i picked up his rod that had one in it and I, I went to cast it and it knotted up in the braid and it flew out of my hands. I mean, flew out of my hands. And I was like, nope. And I, I think I shocked him. I shocked myself. I just jumped in the water, like <laughs> straight up dove into the water, grabbed it and had to like pull myself back on the boat. So, but yeah, you straight braid, but with caution, <laughs> with caution. What is your setup for that when it comes to your rod and reel? Uh, so I throw a rod that's a bit different. I use two rods for it, and they almost feel way too stiff for a topwater, but I I like that because when you get fish on that big bait, you don't want them to fight with all those trebles. You want to crank him in. They're, you don't let them pull you, jump around, and jump with it. Just crank them as fast as you can. Uh, so I throw a 7.4 medium. It's a medium light, but it's not a medium light. If you held it, you would think it was about a medium so i'm just gonna say seven four medium 
and I also have a seven two medium that I throw with it as well. Um, and they're not they're not very parabolic like you would think you would want a uh, a regular topwater rod to be or jerk bait rod or crankbait rod. You actually want it to have a little bit of backbone uh, and actually you know have some flex to it and. 30 pound braid and the highest gear ratio reel you have. I use like an eight to three on mine. Mm, wow. That's insane. Uh, let's see here. Uh, all time favorite combo for Lake Anna. Combo like bait wise or like, um, Ooh. I'm going to say, I guess if we're talking like a combination of like a rod and reel, um, this time of year, I, I would get like a, I would have like a seven, two or seven foot medium spinning rod with, 10 to 15 pound braid and uh, have an eight pound fluorocarbon leader on that because on that you could tie a drop shot you could tie a little vanessa swim bait uh nico rig you could just do i mean you could even throw top you could cut the fluorocarbon leader off and use just a single top water bait if you're talking about like one rod or one combination for that i would use spinning gear just you can do so much with that you know between a moving bait and vanessa baits or even top water yeah. And then another top water I really like to throw, guys. Again, you've heard me talk about this. I will throw a spy bait as a top water bait. And I know this sounds retarded, but it's the fact that I can cast it so far and then you just crank. That's all you do. That's generally what I've done. But then again, walking baits and stuff like that. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Ricky, have you tried ripping a big prop bait? Mm hmm. I've yeah, never that done works. That, before. Hmm. that will work. Um, usually I do that when they're actually more up up shallow um whether yeah. they're going to spawn or there's fry garters or that first post spawn cruiser thing and do hmm. that for sure what color crankbaits um so for me really just naturals um i do like to throw some deep divers on on schools this time of year if you need to fire them up and really just go like a natural shad color or you know uh you can throw like that that parrot whatever the the that like chartreuse with blue and and do that if you're fishing a little bit deeper um early like earlier in the year i i throw a lot of like you know reds and, and crawl patterns and stuff up shallow around rocks on anna um and around grass but yeah just naturals natural bait fish shad herring color crankbait that's what i'd use this time of year awesome stuff awesome stuff what was it like fishing uh the potomac river it was fun so i i don't know um I don't even know if I've told you this before, Thomas, but I, I actually grew up fishing the river more than Anna when I was when I was younger. So I, I spent a lot of time out there fishing all the way up to the DC area. I used to love fishing the city limits area of the Potomac. It was I loved it. Um, so I fished that a ton, and I did fish the Lower Potomac a lot. Uh, it was so nice, honestly, to get out there. I think like the first time me and McCluskey went, like we were flipping pads. I think we we did that like two days in a row. And it felt so good because that's what I'm actually, you know, that's what I used to do a lot more was, you know, flip pads with straight braid and, you know, crank fish out of out of heavy vegetation. So it was a lot of fun. Honestly, it, it was a nice mix up. That's for sure. Was that hard for you to make the transition then from Potomac to Lake Anna? It and, was a little bit. Beginning? Yeah. Yeah, it was a, a little bit when I was going back. Um, but after a few flips and setting the hook on a few, um, even that first day when we were out there, uh, it was like, okay, I got this, got back into the rhythm of, you know, flipping, you know, pretty, you know, precisely making everything clean and, and all that. Cause I, it did, it did feel weird. I was like, I'm not, man, I'm used to panning, throwing out in random spots in open water for the most part or skipping docks. But it was, it was really nice actually to go crap some fish out of pads. What was it like to be on the res? You used to fish the res, correct? Yeah, I used to fish the res quite a bit a lot. Um, it, it's fun. I have so much fun there when I go there. The past two summers, I've I've gone there and, you know, fish some stuff with, with McCluskey. The past, uh, first time we went out this year, man, it was fun. All we did was, or all I did really, I, I had like three rods. Um, all my boat was at Anna. I had like three rods and I went to like Cabela's and bought just like a jig and a few other things. And all we did was just flip laydowns and catch nice fish and, um, caught some i caught a really big one this year right out of lake ridge i dropped my bass boat in i actually caught it off the scope um on a jig relatively like shallow and that was cool that i think that's the biggest fit i caught one at anna that about as big as that but 
I don't know. That place is just so fun. Um, I've definitely seen some tough days out there. Like me and McCluskey, I've, I've had some tough days out there. But this year, I've, I've been there a lot by myself or with him, and it's it's just fun, man. That place is awesome. It's fun. And I've, I've been asked a couple of times, too. You guys, you need to get a nine horse. You need something like that to really explore that place because it, yeah. it is big enough to where just having a trolling motor sucks. Like you just can't explore the whole place. Though you can catch them around, you know, um, Lake Ridge 100%. What are your plans then with all this fishing and trialing that you've been doing? Are you going to try to fish the BFLs next year or the Toyota series? Like what's, what's your plan? Yeah. So that, that is the ultimate goal. Um, I think I was even talking about this with SB, like one day I, I want to jump in and, and do the opens. That's a long time from now. And not because I think I'm, you know, going to be on the elite series or some caliber, but I just, I, I that's something I have to do before, before it's all said and done. Um, I need to jump into the opens travel. Um, but next year, yeah, I'm going to jump in bigger tournaments and hopefully by the following year, I'll have a, a bigger boat. That's, that's kind of the goal. Um, I, I'm even at, even at Anna, I'm out of hand. I know the lake. So I'm at a handicap now. I don't know how many times I've put on tournaments where I've gotten like second place this year or, or been pretty well, but I'm the last boat to get there. Cause I'm, I'm going to like 45 maxed out. And so I, I know I'm handicapped a little bit with the boat right now. I love my boat though. I, I, I love it. It's, it's going to be hard to get rid of it. Um, I mean, I fish with that thing on big bodies of water, small bodies of water everywhere, but bigger boat, more tournaments, definitely going to fish more, more BFLs. Um, going to fish Smith mountain. My parents are moving down to Smith mountain Lake relatively soon. Lucky. Um, so I'll definitely have a lot more time out there. I fished there a ton when I was in tech, but, I'd, I'd love to fish there now with, with what I know and, and how I like to fish. So going to get more comfortable with there and definitely fish some more rivers and stuff as well for the next year. Why the opens versus the MPFL, the Toyota tackle warehouse pro super tour? Like what, why the opens? Um, I don't know, man. It's, it's BASS. That's, that's where it's at. I mean, I don't know that's just me. That's just what I just think of when I think of, high competition, well-run tournaments, um, with not a lunatic owner, I think of BASS. So, and, and I think a lot of people do. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, I think the BFLs are, are like, have been historically, they're great tournaments and MLF has done some really good things. Um, but you know, I don't know. I, I don't like, you know, politicking. I'd want to, I want to yeah. fish. You yeah, know, you know I, what I mean? Like, I don't want to be an organization that's always under fire for something. I think it'd be to me to be probably be the MPFL or the tackle warehouse tour if it's still around because both will give you a hundred thousand dollar check. Um, and I just, yeah, the MPFL, yeah, shout out to the MPFL. Yeah, I think those are they're, great tournaments, they're doing banging. And I just remember some old pros, like, you know, I say old, but it was like five or six, seven years ago when FLW was around, and they always told you, like, how you do it is you go up through FLW. You get your sponsors and your base, and then you have money to fool around with to get on the opens because the opens you're just donating. It's insanely hard to get in the opens. And you look at the Brent Aylers, the Jason Christie's, all those guys that that made the transition. It's really hard just to say like I'm just gonna fish the opens and make it because there's so many people that dump in there. And huge shout out to MPFL because I feel like it gives people another chance to you can make money at it and kind of grow your base to make the jump. So it's yeah. an interesting time. Yeah, I think MPFL is great. Like if I um I actually started trying to watch more of their stuff and um just to get rid of the other stuff. So I watched BASS and MPFL and I think it, what MPFL does, like I've you've heard others talk about this, like Luke Duncan will even say, and when I was started watching it again, it, it reminds me of the old FLW days before, you know, MLF yeah. bought them and just how it's run and, you know, how some guys are doing that. But then the second after weigh in, like they got to go back cause they have to go work, you know, some nine to five or go build a house or something. And um, I don't know. I think it, bringing back that nostalgic feel that you know both of them seem to have lost and that's the thing that flw did extremely well is the fact that it was a working man's 
professional trail, so to speak, where the way they did their tournaments and stuff, you could have another job and still make it work versus the elites. It, it and this is no knock with elites, but like you, that is your thing. If you make the elite series, the idea is like you are a pro angler, like ha, ha, yeah. full stop with how crazy those tours are. Uh, Ricky Folk also says like, uh, elite 70s is a good derby. Elite 70s is a good derby. You just got to get in. I know that's like a lottery ticket to kind of get into that bad boy there, but that's also a good tournament trail. I wish the Toyotas came back with the mid Atlantic series. I wish somebody would do a mid Atlantic series because I think there was two years they did it where it was like um potomac river uh it wasn't smith mountain lake even though it should be kerr and lake norman like you could do a mid-atlantic series for a multi-day event easily so you're not going up to freaking canada um but that's <laughs> that's neither here nor there i'll take back everything i said about mlf if they put a bfl on anna in june that's what we need i don't know why we don't have bfls on anna i dude it's I have some friends that are in Ohio uh, that I met them when I was college fishing and they laugh about it because like Indian Lake is like a pond. It's like 3000 acres and they have 200 boat tournaments. It's you can do it. The Veterans Day tournament last year had almost 200 boats like you can easily do that size event there for better or worse. But yeah, I and for some reason to me, I don't think a BFL on Anna would be really crowded. I think a lot of people, I know how I would look at it from the outside is I would go, oh, that's that's going to be a, a local tournament. Like that's, mm. the, that's what I mean. So, I'm not saying someone couldn't come in from anywhere out of state. There's really good anglers and, and whoop, you know, people's asses out of Fisher a lot. But there's some guys like on Anna where I would see a BFL and, for some reason, I see like on Smith Mountain, you could almost stumble into the right one. It's big enough, right? It's wide open enough where you can get on that. Anna is very, you got to know kind of some certain areas yeah. or spots. Yeah, B. Cal, and yeah, I'll respectfully disagree with you. And like, I think that was used as an excuse, but I got to go to the Veterans Day tournament last year and there was close to 200 boats and it yeah. worked. Like, it could work. I, I think the hotel might be a better argument where maybe there's not enough hotels, but honestly, Every time I've gone to tournaments now, it's like me, SB, and everyone, we just get an Airbnb. So, like, I, I don't know, like, how much that – I guess people do do hotels still. I don't know. Yeah. But um, Fredericksburg isn't, like, that far, too. Like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's, like, a 30-minute drive. I feel like that's mm -hmm. not terrible if you want to travel for it. No. And then, like, Gaston's the other one, too, where I think the Cats finally had something there. I know the Elite 70s go there, of course, like Anna, but it'd be nice to get one on, on Gaston as well. That's 20,000 acres. Like, it could easily work there as well. Yeah, I forgot the Veterans Day tournament does pull in quite. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot. A did lot you fish that last year? I didn't last year. I had something going on. I really did want to. This year, I, I will 100%. Yeah, me, me and SP fished that thing last year, and I was shocked at like not only how many boats there were, but the lake absorbed it pretty well. I was thinking it'd be a lot. Sounds weird. It, I feel like it would fish a lot more crowded than it did, if that makes any sense. Like, it, it wasn't bad. Yeah. Yeah. I think it can spread them out. There's a lot of big creeks, a lot of, um, a lot of shoreline with different cuts and coves. So yeah, I think you could hide boats. And if you, a big group runs up the river, uh, or runs up one of the two splits, you're not even going to see them in the, in the, like, there's going to, the middle section, the dam section is so big enough. It'll spread people out. Let's see. Uh, we got also Michael here, new hotel opening up near Tim's very soon. Oh shit. I didn't know that. Really? Where is that? Oh, oh yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, there is. Was it like a like a nice hotel? Are we talking like for like the one percenters or like a normal hotel? Um. Oh, we're, I had another question for you. Lake House Tap, they have that marina dock thing that is absolutely freaking insane in the size of it. Is that uh, how, yeah. You know yeah that one like I just got down there and finally saw that thing like Jesus God it's big and there's a ton of brush already around that thing. How like hard right off of um right off the bridge, right? You're talking about yeah. the blue roofs. Yeah. Yeah. How hard is it to fish that thing consistently to because I feel like I was there only for a day and I scoped around. I was like, you could probably win here, but it would be annoying as hell. No, you you, you can absolutely do well there. And the TB in the two day two B TBF state championship last year, the first day, that's where we caught big fish for the day and caught a majority of our we had 17 18 pounds or something uh, just off of that marina dock I, it's not a secret there's guys on there's videos of people on youtube fishing that thing and catching huge fish um but there is sweet spots on it and different ways yeah. to fish it um i i caught a um that's 
Yeah, I'll say it. That's where I caught my glide bait fish, actually. And then um, Same. I'd, I've caught a... I've caught a lot skipping a Damiki way under the, the dock with scope there. Um, that's also a good way to get some decent fish out of, off of that dock. Do you think you're at an advantage, though, because of your boat size? Because if you had a 22-foot Ranger, that would, that would be annoying as hell to get back up in there. Yeah, sometimes I do think, as far as those and, and that like tight space right there and those, and those lanes, it, it definitely is, because I can completely... With a 19 foot boat I have, I can completely just turn around and do whatever and uh, get really close to the docks. And I run aluminum too, so like if I hit wood or I don't care, um, I'm, I'll get real real close to skip a bait underneath some of those docks. I also realized I have to set my scope. I personally need to set my scope a little bit differently because I don't want to see 40, 50, 60 feet out because I realize I don't know if that fish is under that main dock of of the of the multiple ones or if it's three over do you reset your distance when you're fishing docks like that just so you know like okay this is just this pylon that i'm seeing not 30 over um i i know what you're saying i think i did i did do that originally especially when i was fishing individual docks um that were isolated but i've a i actually like um having it out pretty far probably to about 80 foot on a big marina dock per se or a really yeah. big to about 80 foot so I can see all the way back in there. And then just from using it so much, you can kind of count, count the posts and know kind of what posts you're looking at. Um, so I like to have it around 80 foot, especially on big Marina boathouse docks. Hmm. That's interesting. That's really and, interesting. And you'll have a lot of fish too on that. Like, I don't know how many times in this specific, if you're fishing a big boat house dock with scope, and you're, you skip something under there, like a Nico wacky rig or, or the Mickey, and, you, and you're working that bait back, and, but you, and you, the fish that you wanted to get to might not have seen it. I don't know how many fish will come off one of those pilings that you didn't see. And, uh, and those are just very good summer spots on every lake, on anywhere. It's big, hot, like shade. They go out, usually roam in the mornings, and then they have somewhere to go back when the sun comes up and hide and you know have structure, and there's always bait there shad spawn on it do you jack up your leader size when you're skipping those baits back there so when you actually lean into them you can get them back yeah um i'm like a really i'm really comfortable with 10 pound fluoro though on like anything <sighs> like i trust 10 10 pound fluoro on on a lot um on a on a damiki though just for some of like fall rate and stuff i i, I fish a damiki rig sometimes on like 15 pound line um and use a shorter shorter leader just to crack into them better um that's mainly just a fall rate thing uh but i'm really comfortable with 10 pound line in brush and, and under docks dude that's freaking awesome let's see brandon says which lake do you think the nvkba event will be one out one which lake do you think the nvkba event will be one out of this weekend uh that would be let's see battle of five lakes which would be like burke lake Sleeters Lake, Lake Frederick, Germantown, and Aquacon Reservoir, Fountainhead. Um, it'll be Fountainhead, like 100%. Fountainhead just has so many freaking fish in it. it and the other lakes will just get pressured too, I think. Like, uh, Frederick sucks unless you have scope. Uh, Germantown is meh. Burke Lake, I, I don't know. Burke Lake could be a sleeper. I don't know who would purposely pick Burke or Frederick. Uh, Sleeters could do it too. Sleeters is the smallest, I think. And so if there's a lot of people on that thing, it's going to get freaking pounded. I, I think it's probably going to be, and we got John there. It won't be, it won't be Sleeters. Weeds are MII. Uh, yeah, I, I, th the problem with Sleeters is, you know, I fished Sleeters last year. It's just too small. Like it, it, if it gets a lot of pressure, you're screwed. Um, I'm picking, I'm probably either going to pick Sleeters or Aquaquan just because I know Aquaquan, if I run into them, I'll, I'll do well. Um, yeah, with the res on that lineup, that'd be hard to say. Yeah. Else. yeah. Which is funny because I won big fish last year and I was fishing Sleeters and no one caught him out of, out of the res, but. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, That's it was awesome. It was one out of the res, but I got big fish out of Sleeters. It's just such a that place is hard though without scope this time of year. Fountainhead or Aquan Reservoir. It's yeah. They they are there are some shallow, but I know just talking from you know SB and Mr. McCluskey, like it's also a deep water thing for sure this time of year. Mm -hmm. That place is the most 
close like a TVA system. I got to fish two of those uh, Sunday tournaments and really looking at that place, like this reminds me a lot like a TVA type of lake, just how it's set up topography wise. It's really a neat place. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. It was like the narrowness too. It has a dam. You can tell when they pull, when they're pulling water from it too. And there's not a lot of like those nice spawning coves and bays that you'd see like on a Smith or an Anna. It's just little patches here and there that, that would be considered spawning. And they spawn yeah. weird there, dude. It's a that's weird spawn. That's what I thought there. too. Yeah. That's what I was saying this year when I went out there. We would see and fish on on places where I'm just like, this fish would not be here on Anna. That is crazy. Like, that's I know. Wild. And I, I saw one like on a log in the middle of like, it just like in about three inches of water. And unless it's, it pushed a bluegill and it made a little splash and I went in there and I finally saw it. But if it wasn't for that, that him pushing that bluegill, I wouldn't have saw him. Like it, they just, it's so crazy how they set up there. Fun. Yeah. Place. Um, looking at everything here, I think, yep. I think that's everything. Sweet. So, uh, yeah, I think that's all the chat there. Tyler, what do you have coming up this summer? What do you got going on? Yeah, so, you know, guide bit, we're pretty booked um, this week and 4th of July week, but we definitely have some openings um, that we can, you know, if you guys want to get out there on Anna. This is my favorite time of year to fish. The fish are grouped up. We have a good time. We try to get out there early and get in before it gets too crazy. Um, but evening trips, morning trips, if you want to get out there and, and catch fish, and, you know, I'll do my best to teach you as much as I can about the lake. And, and yeah, and uh, I'll be fishing a few derbies. I got to figure out. You know how my leg is with the accident I was in, and hopefully figure out some more news tomorrow. Uh, once I go to an orthopedic doctor, and uh, we're still still running trips and everything, and you know, I'll, hopefully I'll be out on the water very soon. No, hundred percent. And as always, guys, link in the episode description to everything we talked about, including to all of Tyler's social media. As always with these things. Uh, about 10 o'clock tonight, this stream will be taken down so I can check to see that YouTube won't be mad about it. And then it'll be re-uploaded to YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all those fun places tomorrow morning. So like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps out in the algorithm. And we are only seven Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. When we hit that, we are setting up a meet and greet uh, this summer. Food and everything will be there for you guys. Absolutely free of charge for Patreon supporters. And we'll also have a bunch of special guests as well. So go check that out. Help us hit our goal. Like, subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.